I'm Beth. And I'm Beth. Welcome, welcome to, to Physics, Physics with Beth and Beth. <laughs> hey, welcome to AP Physics 1, Unit 4. We're on momentum impulse collisions. We have momentum done. The first video was kind of long. Sorry about that. We're going to try to keep them shorter after that. We had a lot to discuss in momentum with concepts, equations, change in momentum, some problems. So we covered a lot. It was a little long. Today we're going to talk about impulse and what impulse is. Impulse, it's not like that impulse to buy that we think about of, oh, especially this time of year, we're like, oh, I really want that. Like a Black Friday deal, that impulse, not the kind of impulse we're talking about in physics. We're talking about a change in momentum due to a force acting over a time. The symbol for impulse, and you're like, okay, that was pretty vague. Still don't know what that is, Beth. <laughs> Hang on. Once we work through this, I think you'll get it. The symbol is a J. Odd, but it's a J. Uh, sometimes you'll see impulse actually written out, but the J is the symbol. The unit is actually, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to tell you what the unit is quite yet because I'm going to show you the equation and I'm sure that you can actually say it with me. Um, but impulse is going to equal force times time. We want in uh, symbols J equals force times a uh, interval of time. So force is in newtons and time is in seconds. So impulse is in newton times a second. And that is the unit. Now let's talk about, okay, that's what impulse is. So now let's talk about why we say it's a change in momentum due to a force acting over a time. It's a change in momentum. Now, here's another thing, actually, with units. Look at this. Uh, impulse can be a newton times a second. It can also be a kilogram times a meter over a second. And you're like, whoa, wait a minute. That's the unit for momentum. Absolutely. So good thing because impulse is equal to that change in momentum. How do I, how do I get that? You're like, how did you get that? Okay, well, newton is a kilogram times a meter over a second squared. Because remember, Newton is the unit for force. Force equals mass, there's your kilogram, times acceleration, your meter over second squared. That is the SI unit for a Newton, that standard international or international standard unit. I multiply that by another second, because we said it's a Newton times a second. So I multiply that by another second, that second, uh, actually cancels out with one of the seconds on the denominator. And look, you have a kilogram times a meter over a second. There you go, voila, we love it when our Newton, when our units work out. All right, perfect. Now let's go. We, so change in momentum, remember we talked about change in momentum. The change in momentum is your momentum final minus your momentum initial, or that's MV final minus mass times initial velocity. Final velocity minus initial velocity. You can actually factor out the M. So you have final velocity minus initial. <clears throat> All right, well, impulse is equal to change in momentum. So that means that impulse is equal to change in momentum. Wait, wait what? What is that? Okay, we didn't just pull that out of the air. That's actually Newton's second law. It's just written a little differently. Look at this. If I said, we said Newton's second law is F equals MA in AP physics. All right, this isn't exactly how Newton wrote it. He actually wrote it in uh, the Principia, how it is on my shirt, with derivatives because he had changing mass and changing velocity. And so he was using derivatives which is AP physics C, but we don't have to worry about that today. We're going to keep it, uh, we're going to keep it with F equals MA, the sum, but I'm going to say, hey, I've only got one force. So I've got one force. I'm going to plug in from acceleration that change in velocity over time because that is the definition of acceleration. It's that change in velocity over time. That's actually just a rewrite of your first kinematics equation. V final equals V naught plus AT. Uh, that, that's actually just a rewrite of that. So we just plug that in for acceleration. Now I'm going to multiply that time interval over, and I get m times delta v. Well, what's delta v? Look at this. It's v final minus v initial. So, wow. Impulse, force times time, 
is impulse right here equals mass times your final velocity minus your initial velocity is change in momentum. So we didn't just pull this out of the air. It's actually the second law, just written a little differently. You love it when all that works out. And that is the concept behind impulse. Now, here's the other thing, and I'm going to actually, I'm actually going to erase this, and I'm going to box this, because this is the important the important equation that you need to remember that impulse equals change in momentum. Um, now, this is actually, this whole little equation here, safety engineers in the automobile industry are very interested in, in this whole concept that change in momentum is equal to impulse because this is really why we have uh, airbags in our cars. We have breakaway telephone poles now. We have breakaway on ramps or off ramps on exits on highways and this is why when you are when I shouldn't say when uh, when a car collision is about to occur the velocity that the car is going is the velocity it's going you know you can't do much about that at the right at the point of impact you can't do much about the mount you can't do anything about the mass of the car at that point as well so this kind of stays the same this side but if they can increase your time to stop so whoever's in that car right before impact if they can increase the stopping time then they can decrease the force because it's going to have the same change in momentum it's going to be going in with some initial velocity and it's going to be stopping at the end and the mass the car has is the mass it has so that's the same but they can increase time, you can reduce the force on a person's body that's in that car. How do they do that? Well, instead of your head hitting the windshield immediately and stopping in a split second, they can have an airbag that slows down the stopping of your head and reduces the force on the head. All right. They can also uh, put in side airbags for that for that T-bone again, increasing the time to, for your body to stop, so decreasing the force on the body. Same thing with the breakaway telephone poles. Also, the crumple zone in the car. You hear some of the um, older generations say they don't make cars like they used to. You know, they used to never bend in a car accident. Okay, that's not a good thing uh, because we would rather the car bend than our bodies, right? So if they can increase that crumple zone, as it crumples, the car crumples, it's taking more and more time for it to stop versus just hitting something, not bending at all and stopping in a split second. So you're increasing the time of that car to stop to decrease the force on your body. So the safety engineers are doing an amazing job out there on keeping us safe in, in our cars. The other thing where this applies, if you think about this, if you go to jump, let's say you're a basketball player and you're out on the court and you go to jump to make a shot and you come down, we do this instinctively. We are using this and understanding this instinctively in our bodies. We don't lock our ankles and lock our knees and just come right straight down on it because that would be an instant stop time, which would increase the force on our legs and could break our legs or our ankles or any, any bones uh, that are in our legs and, and our feet. But what do we do? We actually, when we come down, when we're jumping, we bend our knees and we slowly stop and that increases, I should say, we increase our stopping time, reducing the force on our legs. So we instinctively use this all the time, whether we, we knew the equation for it or not. So anyway, that's impulse and that's change in momentum. So now let's talk about graphing it over here. And by the way, this is going to be the equation you're going to use in problems a lot. Okay, we're going to get ready to do a problem over here really quickly. Now, let's talk about graphing though. I have two graphs. I have a force on this side on my, my y-axis, my rise. It's in newtons. I have displacement, well, position actually, in meters on my x-axis. Okay, we know that slope is rise over run. I'm going to put that over here. Slope is equal to rise over run. But something we might not have thought about is the area under it. The area under it is equal to rise times run because area is the side times the side, right? So your area is equal to rise 
times run, meaning what's on the vertical times what's on the horizontal. In this problem, we have, if we did force times your delta x, oh, what do we get? We get work, right? We take force times your displacement, we get work, and that would be parallel. But so the area under here is equal to work. Now look at this graph though. We have force times uh, uh, force on the rise. We have time on the run, all right, on that x-axis. So that's going to be uh, for if we take the area, that's going to be rise times run is force times time. Oh, look at that. That's impulse. The area under that is impulse. Now, if I wanted to solve this problem, I actually put numbers in, and they said, hey, find the area under this. You would actually find the area of this triangle, which would be 1 half base times height, which would be 8, and that's impulse, so Newton times seconds, so I'm going to put 8 Newton times seconds. And then I would take this rectangle, which would be base times height, and that would be 8 as well, Newton seconds. And if I wanted that total area, that would be 16 Newton seconds would be your total impulse from the area under that curve, and you could figure that out by the force time graph. All right, just want to show you that. Now let's go up to this problem right up here, and I'm going to kind of erase some of this so I can do the problem. I have a ball, and we actually did this in the momentum problem, I mean the momentum video before, but I had a ball going at the wall at 12 meters per second. It's bouncing off and returning at 5 meters per second, and that collision was in 2.0 milliseconds. And that is one thing about our impulse. It's going to be in very, very small increments of time. So you're going to need to get that converted to seconds, though. It has to be in seconds because it's a Newton times a second, the unit. So we're going to need to convert that to seconds. And by the way, milliseconds, you go 3 to the left, so that's going to be 0.002 seconds. So I have one, two, three that I went over. What they're asking for is what is the change in momentum and the force of the wall on the ball? Here we go. We have a change in momentum. And remember, I said in the last video, watch this, watch this. They're not going to tell you that's negative five, but velocity has direction, and that's west, so that's negative. My change in momentum is that mass times my final velocity minus my initial. Change in momentum. Oh, and they, I forgot to tell you, this was a one kilogram ball. Silly me. That's one. Final velocity is negative five. That's the final. It was going into the wall, it bounced back, and they're not going to give that to you. You got to add it. Minus 12. So my change in momentum is a negative 17 kilograms times meter over a second. It's also a Newton times a second. Now, here's the deal. You have to recognize, and we talked about this in the first video, that's going to give you a bigger change in momentum than if this object just stopped at 12. It would have been a negative 12 meters per second. So when it bounces back, it gave you a bigger change in momentum. Now we can take that and we can figure out what the force was uh, from the wall because we know that our impulse equals change in momentum, so that's force times time equals our change in momentum, which was mv final minus mv initial. Whoa, sorry, minus velocity initial. Final velocity minus initial. We already know this. It's negative 17. Our force is what I'm looking for. My time was 0 0.002 seconds. So I'm going to go ahead and divide that, and my force comes out to be 8,500 newtons, and that's negative. And it should be negative. The wall's going to push it back to the west, and that should come out negative. There we go. That is how you do a impulse problem. You're going to set it equal to our change in momentum, and you're going to figure out force. Maybe they want you to figure out time, something like that. Maybe they give you force and time, they want a velocity. Now remember, change in momentum is always about one object. We're talking about one object with the ball. When we get to our collision videos, which is the very next video we're doing, you're going to see two objects, and you're going to see conservation of momentum, not change in momentum. Those are two totally different things. And your change in momentum is going to be final minus initial, and it's going to be one object. 
when we get to collisions, it's going to be conservation of momentum and a different concept that you'll see in the next video. Thank you for watching. Give it a, a like if you like this video. If you haven't subscribed, we'd love for you to subscribe. And thank you for watching. Happy physics -ing.